are listening to The J-Boy Show, your number one source for Auburn and the SEC. My goal was to run through his soul and grab his heart when I, when I run through his soul. Through his soul. Kurt, Nate, Coach Dad. Those are memories. memories. I think we've established ourselves as, I think, the premier conference in college football. College football. Now, the SEC is, is, is better at the top. It's better in the middle. It's- the Southeastern Conference remains the premier conference. Yeah. and everybody else trying to catch it. I think this is probably the best league from a competitive venue standpoint. They have the most capable team. You just look at those programs, the way they recruit, how they invest. Snap to Burrow. Three steps. Fires. Back corner of the end zone. Over the shoulder. Catch. Did he hold on? He did. Justin Jefferson. Touchdown. Now, your host, J-Boy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special Thursday edition of the J-Boy Show. Uh, we are joined by uh, SEC basketball legend, college basketball uh, coaching legend. Uh, everybody in Auburn and knows him, and, and he's he's one of the uh, one of the people that needs to be on Mount Rushmore when they build it in Auburn, and that's former <laughs> Auburn head basketball coach, Sonny Smith. Coach, it's, it's an honor to talk to you. Well, it's an honor to be uh, get an introduction like that. <laughs> I'll make care of you around doing introductions for me. That was great. Thanks a lot. Hey, it's the it's the truth. And and again, I, I do. I kind of want to start um, kind of in the present a little bit. You know, you 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 get to Auburn. You're at East Tennessee State, VCU, and you get to Auburn. You have a bunch of success. You know, you coach Charles Barkley, and really, what was what was you know the golden era, pretty much of, of Auburn basketball before Coach Pro got here and kind of kind of reinvigorated it. How just how awesome is it for you uh, as, as a guy that's seen it when it was and and what it is, and, and to see Auburn where they're at now? You know, when I was coaching here, I was thinking myself, you know, we we go to the final eight. And I'm thinking, well, we might could win it all. But and I got to thinking, well, what would be the what's going to keep you from that? And I was thinking, we we probably going to need a different arena so that we can fill it up yeah. and get uh, get the kind of support that we need at games. Other than that, I think it's thirteen five or something mm-hmm. that we had in the old place, and it's only filled a couple of times a year. And you need and you is is a big old bar. You've been in. Jewel leaves, oh, you know yeah, how it yeah. is, uh, and it. Uh, I thought it was holding us back, and then when I saw what happened when they put the new arena in here, uh, it, it happened just kind of like I thought it would. If that ever came to play, whoever was there at the time is going to take advantage of what kind of home court it's going to be, because. We kind of got it going, mm-hmm. and it was hard to get it going. And I always thought, is anything holding us back? It might have been the old arena. I don't know. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And again, just like anything, you know, when you when you put something new and fancy somewhere with with a, with a fan base like at Auburn's, it, it is going to take off. And and coach, I, I want to go back. So so you get to Auburn when, when you took the job at Auburn. What? What was kind of your thinking of, of, you know, what you could do, how fast you could do it? Or, or did you just go in there and say, listen, uh, you know, this is how we're going to do it? Well, I never went in with the my way or the highway type mm-hmm. of uh, approach because I didn't know the SEC from from the outside looking in. I didn't know where you would have to recruit to win at Auburn and what you would have to do to win at Auburn. And we were on probation at that time, so it, it was a little more difficult to get it going quick. So I had to make up my mind, how are we going to approach this? And and we came up with the idea, I say we, uh, basically me, we, I, I decided I had to recruit inside out. Mm-hmm. I had to fight Alabama and the surrounding teams in the SEC that, that came into the state and got the players out of here. And I thought if, if I could just get the state split up with Alabama, get half of them or get somebody that, that can turn a program for you, that we can make it here. And I had a I had a really good player here when I took the job, a guy named Bobby Cadditch, who, mm-hmm. who was uh, Charles Barkley at six eight, 
and 250 pounds. But then he had a his appendix ruptured on him at night. No, with nobody there, and he almost died for it. We got him to the hospital. Jan and I spent all our time with him, and he never came back to the to the Bobby Cadage that we had. He was he would have been. He would have been guys that we talk about now in the same vein as Barkley and, and Person and, and those kind of guys. Well, uh, we we lost him because of, of, a, of a ruptured appendix that did, didn't ever come back and kind of set us back that first year. But then we kind of we started getting some uh, Alabama guys. Mm -hmm. And when you did that, uh, the program totally changed. And we, we, start, we got it going pretty good, really. Definitely, and and it was the really the turning stone for Auburn basketball. You know, making that. Did, what did they call it back then, Coach? Was it the Elite Eight back then? Was it the Final Eight? Did they have a different name for it? Elite Eight. Elite Eight. Elite okay. Eight so it's was always the thing. Elite Eight. We were a basket away from going, and we took a bad shot. Purvis Ellison blocked it all the way into backcourt, <laughs> and Jeff Hall for Louisville picked, they caught it on a run and laid it up, and the game was over. You know, I got to thinking, boy, we lost, I think, to the national champions in the tournament three or four times. It seems like Auburn always does that. You know, it happened with, with Marquise Daniels and then when they ran into Syracuse and lost by one, yeah. and then Auburn loses to Virginia in the Final Four, and they win it. And it's even funnier because the team wore Tampa team just lost to a team that is probably going to win the whole TBT tournament. So it's just kind of interesting. Auburn uh, Auburn always draws somebody that typically wins the tournament. But, Coach, uh, obviously I know everybody asks you about, you know, uh, Charles Barkley and, and being a part of that. But there was a big growth process, you know, for him when he got to Auburn. Can you just for a second kind of talk about, you know, how you found Charles? And number two, just how you kind of helped, you know, mold him to become the not only the player but the man he is today. Well, I had a I had an assistant named Herbert Green. It was a great assistant. I, I always said if I could have kept Herbert on the staff, I think we'd have won a national championship because he could fight Alabama for Alabama players. Yeah. And he could he could split the state with them, and that's exactly what we needed. And he could do that. Well, he he had seen Charles. He he just saw when he was younger. He thought, man, if this guy were to lose some weight, he might be something special. So he kept following him around, and uh, he says, he goes, he comes to me and he says, Sonny, I want you to go look at this kid. He said, uh, you love people that can score inside and people, people that are strong. So I go to see him play. The first time the ball went up on a board, he, he jumped up in the air and got it, and threw it to midcourt before he ever hit the floor. He turned around and threw it to point guard out there. And I, I, Wes Hunsell the only guy I'd ever seen do that. Yeah. Uh, before he could hit, you know, throw it out to midcourt before he hit the floor. That's insane. And I was thinking, that's something special. This guy can jump and run like a deer, and, and he's um, – Many, many pounds overweight. And then uh, right after that, I wasn't at the game, but they played. Bobby Lee Hurt was the best player in the state by reputation mm -hmm. at that time. Well, Bobby Lee Hurt and Charles played against each other in a tournament. Barkley had like 25 points, 20 rebounds, and 11 block shots. And um, he actually destroyed Bobby Lee Hurt. <laughs> and everybody at that point... Nobody's recruiting Charles because they thought he's too heavy, too short, and he didn't love academics. And so uh, at that point, everybody jumped in trying to get Charles. So it made it a lot more difficult for us to get him because we already had him at that point. That one game, though, made Charles uh, say he might be the best player in his state. Well, it's either he or Bobby Lee Hurt, and it ended up that way. Ennis Watley was in that mix, mm -hmm. also a kid that played at Alabama. Well, we we had Charles uh, pretty much locked up because he had a teacher in the program there that was an Auburn graduate, and she's always talked to him about Auburn. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles comes on a visit, spent more time with my wife than he did anybody because he wanted to get to know the coach's family. Mm -hmm. And they, I, I think he had missed that family life a little bit when he was at home. Uh, and I, I, don't, I wouldn't so wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the ranch on that, but I think he missed something. Yeah. And uh, he he uh, 
he spent most of his time with my wife, Jan. And, and I was thinking to myself, he wants a family type situation. And he basically got it. Yeah. He basically got it. Now, he was hard to coach. But, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've talked on so many shows. Uh, and I've said that uh, he was difficult to coach. I and mean, here I think the problem was, was more me than it was him. And what, I, what I'm trying to say is I don't think I knew how to coach superstar. Yeah. I mean, and he was. Yeah. He was a superstar in the making. Yeah. And I didn't know how to coach him. Like, for instance, Pat Dye had Bo Jackson. Yeah. Well, Pat knew how to coach superstars. Because probably with his coaching at Alabama, yeah, Georgia, around and playing where he did, he probably knew what it was like. But I'd never had a superstar. In all my years recruiting before I got to be a head coach, I only recruited one guy that turned out to be a superstar. Well, I didn't know how to coach him. And I thought that you had to be hard on them. I mm-hmm. thought you had to drive them. And Charles needed just the, the opposite. The love. And he needed the love. He needed to be ignored when he didn't want to practice hard. Yeah. And I ran him to death and did everything I could to be tough on him. And as, as I look back, he had all those skills that it turned out that to have when he got to the pros. If I had managed him better, he'd got there early. He'd got those numbers early. Like people will say, I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but uh, people will say that Charles, uh, that Dean Smith at North Carolina and Sonny Smith are the only two coaches that could hold Michael, uh, Michael and Charles to 17 points a game. That's what they <laughs> average, both of them. Wow. And, and again, <laughs> Coach, you I, think about that. That's, that's not a good rep to have, but, uh, uh, and he, he, he could have averaged a lot more. Well, Coach, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. I know you're a very humble guy. I just, you know, I, I look at it and, and you were around the situation, you know, maybe. You know, and, and again, you know it way better than me, but, but you know, again, you look at what Charles has done and, and what he's become. And do you ever wonder, though, if those times where you were hard on, because I've heard him talk, you know, really about you as a father figure, as, as a guy that, that was hard on him when he, when he needed somebody to be hard on him, that loved him when he needed to love him. Do you think that that hard love that you showed him, though, I mean, do you believe that's something that, that he carried forward that when you get to the NBA and you have coaches, but you have to be self-driven that he went back and remembered those suicides and, and laps that you had him run and, and yeah. you know, accountability. So, so I know, I know exactly where you're coming from, but, but coach, I think just my personal opinion, you handled that, you know, you had success and set him up to, to be the guy that he always wanted to be. And, and like I said, I've heard him, I've heard him talk about you and he talks about you in, in glowing regard. Well, I do him also. I give, I give you a story. I don't know how long we got. Oh, you but, go, Coach Smith. I'll talk to you for six hours, man. You just tell me. You well, just, you here's, a, here, here's a good example of Charles Barkley today. Charles, my wife was in the hospital for 41 days. It was a condition that we finally got cured up. And he comes to visit her. He sits on the side of the bed with her for three hours. Well, the nurses kept coming to the room and sticking her head in the door so they could see who, you know, take a look at Charles Barkley. Finally, the supervisor of nurses came and said, Mr. Barkley, would you come out here and take pictures with the nurses so I can get them to work? They all want to come to look in this do- door and I can't get any work out. He goes outside, and they gathered all the nurses up and they took pictures. He walked away from that and walked down to the end of the hall and started going into the patient's rooms. Wow. He went in and shook everybody's hand all the way down that wall, uh, that hall. And he came back and stayed another hour with Jan. So, you know, that was, that was the Charles Barkley that people hear about. But that was, a, that was the best thing that I've seen him do in a long time. And I've seen him do a lot of good things. Yes, sir. And it again, just shows you the type. The type of person that he is, and the and the type of person that uh, that you are. My my question to you, coach, is, you know, you 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 coach back then. You talk about the new arena. I, I want to talk about kind of the way the games changed. You know, obviously yeah. three pointers now are, are are like layups back then. But just how crazy it for you? How crazy is it for you as a guy that coached the game, that has seen the game evolve? Turn on the TV and now and uh, just see how crazy different it is. I think what happened is 
coaches controlled the game for years. I think they coached the game and they were in control of who took the shot, who got this many shots, who was putting his best rebounders in position to rebound. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, these guys started going into the pros that could beat anybody off the dribble. Yeah. Anytime the clock was running down, they'd take the ball and just beat them off the dribble and they'd either hit something themselves or get it to somebody for a wide open shot. Yeah. I think everybody started going to school on that. So what they did instead of running set plays, well, they would run some, but guys years ago would run one every time down the floor that they didn't run a fast break. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden, they go, they go to a thing called spacing. They started spacing the players about six feet or better apart. So one guy couldn't guard both yeah. two, two guys. They social distance before the social distance. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's good. And uh, the game changed right then. It became an individual move type of thing mm -hmm. because the players kept getting better and better by watching guys that could dribble between their legs behind the back and make a play out of it. Yeah. And, and you think about it. I bet you were at the game. Uh, young young man, uh, I, I might Jalen Williams, it might have been. Yep. Took the ball, threw it off the backboard, run it down, and dunked it. Uh, as a now, freshman. Do you remember? You saw? Did you see the play? I saw. I saw it. I, and Auburn was down by nine, Coach, in the second half. Oh, really? To Tennessee, see, they're I, down by I, nine. I've been telling that story. I didn't know they were down by nine. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, that showed me what the game is today. It's a game of individual ability. How to take advantage of the dribble drives for yourself or somebody else. And it. Uh, Bruce Pearl's a master at spacing. Mm -hmm. And the guys that play for him are going to get more opportunities to do it because, yeah, you, you, you hear a lot of talk, I'm sure, about spacing. Yeah. Well, Bruce Pearl's the first guy that I have seen that ends up spacing after moves are made. You know, usually you just got spacing when the, when the, the first move towards yeah. the basket yeah. starts, then you got something else. Well, he has them spaced out so when a guy gets in the lane on a dribble, he knows where people are that he yeah. can kick to if they stop him. And they get wide open shots. And he's so good at spacing. So the game now, it takes it takes more care and gets more out of the players with, with individual ability than ever before. They can give the NBA all the, all the credit for that, but uh, I don't know. But whoever whoever it was... Uh, changed the game of basketball and and made it, I think, probably better for the fans. Yeah. Do you think, Coach, that, that that's comparable to the Ford Pass in football, just the way it opened up offenses? I, you know, somebody else asked me that, and I would say yes. Okay. That, like the stuff, say, that Coach Malzahn runs, open up, thing, doing things that uh, that take advantage of uh, of the athletes' abilities more. Yeah. Well, yes, I think. I don't know who got it from who. But both sports do that, yeah, that, very, very that, well. Yeah, that makes sense. And again, it's it's something that really has blossomed the offenses. And you know as well as I do, offense sells tickets, defense wins championships. But sure. you know, you know, coach, uh, I know you have some great stories, and I, I would love to hear one just uh, from any of your time coaching, um, uh, just from your experience. I, I would love to hear one of your best, if you don't mind. If there's one you kind of got that that you're kind of go to. Well, it's just, when you start, when people ask me about who was the best athlete you ever had, mm -hmm. and I say it was Chris Morris. Wow. Because he could jump out of the gym, run like a deer, spent 13 or 14 years in the NBA, and had been involved in that, in that, at that house when the player shot somebody. I can't, I don't remember exactly who it was. He was there and it made his contract, it made his uh, NBA career come a little bit to a halt because he was in that room. But when I had him, we we're playing in Illinois one night and uh, it comes down to a final shot. We both got a hundred, so we really weren't guarding each other real well. Yeah. And it was in the finals of their tournament, I believe. He comes over to the bench on a timeout. We got the last second try at it. He said, Coach, Coach, throw, 
run that play where you throw it up in there and I dunk it. And I said, I looked at him. I said, Chris, what's the name, what's the name of that play? <laughs> oh, coach, you know I don't know any of the plays. You just throw it up in there and I'll dunk it. Well, it was it was a play where we call it five up. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put him on the block and run him up to the top. But, uh, so they, we think we're going to hit him up there. Yep. And then we, we run up and screen for him with a little guy, smallest yeah. guy on the floor. So they can't switch it. If they do, he can still dunk it. Well, he, we run the play. He liked to tore the rim down. <laughs> he come running over instead of running back on defense. We we still had to defend that last shot. He run over there and stopped right in front of me and put his hands on his hip, winked at me. That's so awesome. Yeah, That's so awesome. So, they didn't, so did they call it, Coach? They didn't call it. Did he not say, Coach? I want the oop. So they didn't call it alley oop back then. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they did. Okay. They, they did. Uh, yeah, we, we – <laughs> they called it a lot of names, but they did call it by that. So Chris Marks is one of the best athletes ever had, and he was, he was easy to coach, but you needed to give him freedom, Yeah. and I didn't give him enough. And uh, But if I had given him a little more, he could have been – he was – well, he's special anyhow, but he was good. That's one of the things I like. And one of the things that got us beat, and, and with our chance to go to the Final Four is another story. We call timeout, and we got a chance to make the basket that's going to win the game against Louisville. Louisville was playing a zone. And they, they always played man, but they zoned us for some reason. Yeah. And I still had all these good shooters, and I, I, didn't, I didn't think they could. Be. So we called timeout, and I set up a play where we screened the backside of a zone for a person to take the shot. But we couldn't skip it because of, they were so tall on the yeah. perimeter. Yeah. So. The ball was supposed to go inside to Jeff Moore because Purvis Ellison would guard him. He'd just stand off of him, block his shot if he shot, yeah. you know, that type of thing. And they were playing a 2-3 zone. Well, we screened the back of the zone perfectly. We threw the ball into Jeff Moore to make the pass. And Jeff, thinking that he was so wide open and he'd win the game for us, he shoots the ball. Purvis Ellison knocked it into backcourt. Jeff... Hall, the guard for Louisville, picked it up and laid it up. Game over. They're going to Final Four. But, you know, you, you set a play and it doesn't work out. And you you remember those. That's that's yeah. one of the things that uh, really jumps out at me. But uh, Jeff Moore was a great player. If he hadn't broke his hand, he'd been in the NBA with the rest of these guys. But he made a bad mistake there because – being open around Purvis Ellison didn't mean you're open. Yeah, exactly. He wanted you to think you were open. Oh yeah, yeah. seven three or whatever. I, I may be wrong about that height number, but it's up. Isn't it? It's about seven. I yeah, believe. it's it's tall it's, enough. Tall enough where you know you got to live in a house they specially make for you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, but that's but that's, that. that's two stories. But that's uh, that's I, there's a ton of them. But that's, oh, I bet, uh, I bet. But and I really appreciate you sharing that, Coach. And and kind of as we wind down, I, I want to ask you about something I've always found really interesting. You know, you and Coach Pearl are are and and Cliff Ellis are in a, a very rare air that has had a lot of success at Auburn in basketball. Do you and Coach Pearl uh, is how is y'all's relationship? I know y'all have a good relationship, but you know, will you go in there and we all kind of pick each other's brains, or is it more kind of just philosophy stuff? You know, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but no, we we never talk about play. Mm-hmm. We never talk about defenses, offensives, and things like that. He t- we talk about recruiting, things that we did in recruiting, how to keep get keep the people involved. And he will ask you a ton of questions, and he's the best at the stuff yeah. of anybody. You yeah. don't need that. You need to ask him questions. Yeah. See, he has he's the best I've seen at getting the students involved. Bar none. I don't think anybody can get them more involved than he can. He's the best at getting alumni involved. Yeah, he is the best at off the court things of anybody I've ever seen. Well, you then say, what's next? What's next? That's really good. He's the best practice coach that I've watched in a long time. Yeah, the guy is is terrific, and he never sleeps, and he's a workaholic. And I just uh, he was great. Cliff Ellis is another guy. Uh, 
if he hadn't had the probation type thing, Cliff Ellis would be a Hall of Famer. Yeah, he would. He will be anyhow, probably. But Cliff Ellis was a great coach here, and you know the teams that he had. I know. I was. I was actually Coach Smith. I told Marquis Daniels, uh, Daniels this when I was eleven and twelve. I was the uh, the ball boy that sat under the basket and and, and uh, oh, wiped were the, you? Yeah, I was. Well, and uh, tell me this, hey, Tess, you and I have met, haven't we? Oh, we've met. Yeah, we met. I think we've met twice. Um, actually, twice. once when yeah, I was a okay. ball boy, and I I'm think it's around Auburn one time. I'm so old. I'm so old. I'm not forget who I am. Oh, coach, I'm not. I'm not show. important enough for you've met a lot more oh, important coach, people than me. Ain't nobody like that to me. <laughs> I know, I know, but uh, but coach, it's it's um, it's just so cool to me to to be able to to talk to you because you've you've seen you know just the whole thing with basketball and and now with the, with the one and dones and and the last question I want to ask you. And I know you've seen it. Is is now you know the G League coming in and and offering money to you know high school guys? Which I mean, if I'm 18 and you offer me 500 grand to play basketball, I'm gonna take it. But yes. you know, do you think it's overall good for the game to have kids going? And I know you have LeBrons every now and then, and, and you have guys that have had success, but you've had way more that haven't had success than have at a high school. Do you sure. think kids are ready at a high school? That's my question. I know, I, it's no. I know it's loaded. I think no, but they have proven us all wrong by the guys that have gone straight there and were productive. Mm -hmm. They've proven us wrong. And I don't think the NBA has taken guys, unless it's a real tall guy that they took a gamble on, yeah. guys that didn't have the talent coming out of high school and going straight there. They had the talent. And I think uh, I, years ago, I would think that um, kids needed – half the kids you had didn't have enough money to go to college. They yeah. couldn't do the they, – they didn't have enough money to buy their clothes, do anything. And those things right now, there's no, it doesn't seem to be the same to me. Yeah. I think kids – can make a decision not based on finances. Well, they make a decision based on what's best for their abilities. And some of them don't go. The, but other people think the G League is better for them because uh, the talent level is going to be a little better every night. So I, 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 I haven't made up my mind about yeah. the G League, but I will say this. They've made it better over the years, and they've made it better for players. And look what it did for Jared Harper. Yeah. And Bryce and Brown, I, I say Bryce. I yeah. don't know how well Bryce did in the in the G League, but uh, uh, he might have done better he did, than I he thought. He did. Uh, he played for the main Red Claws. He actually did really well, and they're talking about him getting a uh, two way spot uh, for the Celtics next year. Well, I tell you one thing: the one thing that he never ever got as much credit for, he was a lockdown defender. Yeah, he was, and everybody and Chuma was too, and everybody talked about Chuma and how good Jared was for his size. But Bryce was the guy that would chase somebody around the whole night and still drop twenty five. Right. And he, you know what? He would do it without fouling you. Yeah. I mean, he could stay in the game. Other guys would get all aggressive with them and end up in foul trouble. But Bryce. Uh, very rarely, and he always, if you, if you look back, he always had the toughest guy. Yeah. Uh, on the perimeter, and he could, and he could, he could dog him. He really could. He I always thought uh, he'd be a first round corner in the NFL. At, at at his height, with his speed, I just think he'd be an unbelievable corner, just because his his feet are so good. And and you talk about him not fouling. He just he always seems smart. under control on defense. Yeah, you know what? You know what I think hurt him probably more than that. I probably have never said this on a show before. Was his attitude before, uh, before uh, uh, Bruce Pearl became a factor in his life? Really? I think I think he was a little bit lackadaisical mm -hmm. at times, and uh, uh, he, he'd be in practice, but he wouldn't be there. You yeah. know, he's yeah. there, but he wasn't there. Yeah. And Bruce Pearl fixed it so. I don't know how he did it, and I go to a lot of practices I should know, but he turned him into a practice player, and that's all he needed. Yeah, you that's practice, all he needed, and than he the game turned into him and made him good. Yeah, that's exactly right. And again, that's that that happens, you know, a lot of times, and people don't even realize it, you know, unless you're there. It's especially in football because you know as well as I do, not everybody loves football practice, so it's uh, it's it's really a dogfight. But Coach Smith, uh. 
I really appreciate you coming on. I'd love to have you back on as we get closer to the season because you're one of the few guys that really knows what he's looking at. And I just, uh, I really appreciate you. And, and and again, man, just you know how much respect that, that I have and my family has for you and, and yours. And I just really appreciate you. Man, bless your heart. Thank you so much for having me on. You can call me anytime. You know, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm an old man. I'm just sitting here watching Western. <laughs> hey, yes, sir. I, I love it. And <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Yes, Thank sir. you very much. I, I appreciate you, Coach Smith. Bye-bye. That was former Auburn legendary coach Sonny Smith, top class guy. Great stories there. Talking about Charles Barkley, really giving you guys some insight on on how the program has evolved and, and really what makes it happen and, and kind of his approach when he got there. And uh, for you guys that don't know, you younger Auburn fans that don't know much about Coach Smith, it, it, it's worth a Google. He's a guy that, that helped lay the bricks for that foundation that you walk into now in Auburn Arena and see and you see college game day come in and doing all that stuff. He was one of the main people that, that started that and has seen it through and I really appreciate him coming on. But uh, as always, appreciate you guys. Remember, you can catch us on Twitter uh, and Instagram at The J Boy Show, thejboyshow.com. Yep, thejboyshow.com. Make sure you go check it out. Brand new website. Uh, the guys at IBN did an unbelievable job. Uh, we got merchandise on the way in there and, and everything you guys could want. So again, thanks so much. Uh, shout out Investor Brand Network. Shout out Faison doing his Hogwarts in the studio. Uh, you guys are the best. It's been another special edition of The J Boy Show and J Boy is going, 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 going. gone.